this must be the last one. But um, so this sermon series, things the Lord hates. What's your first reaction? Very intriguing. You just want to hear more about it, more about what the Lord hates. <laughs> You know, I tried to, as I was preparing, you know, we were going to youth on Friday, and I was trying to share, like, just a little glimpse of what I wanted to share, and I don't know really what happened Friday. I don't know if it made sense or not, but I realized it was pretty hard to talk about it almost sometimes, you know, because usually we like to hear about the love of God. We like to feel good, go home, like Igor said, you know, but we don't want to hear about what the Lord hates, and Sometimes we like the fire and brimstone preaching, you know, where fire comes from heaven and, you know, kind of scare people into believing. But in Romans 2, 4, it says that his kindness leads us to repentance. So it's not that we're trying to scare you into coming to the Lord, but it is his kindness. It's his love that draws you and leads you to repentance. And another scripture, because really I want to differentiate between believers and unbelievers. You know, if you're a believer, if you're saved, if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Like this, this series and these topics are not here to condemn you because if you are in Christ, there is no condemnation. And it says that you're free from the law of sin and death. You're free from those things. And really today as... So I'm going to talk about a lot of things. I'm going to talk about the things that the Lord hates, sin, wickedness, but also God's love. But the reality that I want to convey is God's heart. I, I want to reveal God's heart in this. You know, the Bible also says that if, you're, if you are not speaking out of love, if there's no love in what you're saying or what you're speaking... What does it say? You're nothing but a noisy, loud symbol. You know, and that's not what I want to be this morning. I want it to be love and truth and kindness and to just reveal God's heart in this, that it would lead us to repentance. Does that make sense? So I want to go over a few things before I, we get into the haughty eyes. There's a few things that I want to go over. So the main passage is Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. A very lovely passage here. I'll read it. Verse 16. It says, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who stirs, stirs up conflict in the community. So we have a list here of the things that God hates, right? And according, he's just listing off things. They're more like attitudes and actions. And then that the very last verse, when Igor even read this last week, you know, it's pretty strong statements here. These are pretty strong statements. In verse 19, when it says, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You know, these are people. And honestly, when, he, when Igor was talking about it, I was kind of, I was sitting in my seat and I was kind of like, man, it was just stirring inside of me, you know, because it's very contrary to what you're usually hearing. You're like, man, God loves you, you know, we hear that constantly, you know, but there's so much truth in the rest of scriptures that we don't, we don't hear about and we don't hear the teaching about. Why? Maybe because no one wants to talk about it, right? Maybe it's hard to talk about it. Does anyone want to come up here and talk about it? So it's really something you want to push away. But the distinction between, you know, an unbeliever and a believer, you know, when you come to Christ, when you repent of your sins, at that moment of saving faith, you are transferred from the, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You know, sin is removed. All things are made new. And obviously on this earth, we still have our flesh and we're in this process of sanctification, you know, until we come in to be with the Lord. So there's, there's two points I want to make before we get into the haughty eyes. 
So it's like an obvious question, obvious answer, but it's like, does the Lord hate? I would say yes, he does, based on scripture. You know, I'm going to go through these things, but it will make sense when I finish. But you, you, have, to, you have to stick with me. And I don't think God's exaggerating when he's set. I don't think it's not in his nature to even exaggerate, because that would be kind of lying. You know, God speaks the truth, and he means what he says. So we're going to look at a few passages in Isaiah, and I'm not cherry-picking these Bible verses, but it, I believe it's very clear here to just prove the point that the Lord does hate. And it says in Isaiah 61, verse 8, it says, For I, the Lord, I love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. And in Zechariah 8, 17, it says, Do not plot evil against each other. Do not love to swear falsely, a.k.a. lie. He's like, and this is what the Lord says, this, these things I hate. And then we look at Jesus in the New Testament. What does he say? In Revelation 2, verse 6, it says, But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the, I don't even know how to say it, Nicolaitans. So he's talking to the Christians in Ephesus, and he says, you hate these practices. And what does Jesus say? He says, I, which I hate also. So the Lord hates those, those practices. And it seems pretty clear in Scripture that the Lord does hate. And when we read that passage in Proverbs, you know, he's talking about deeds. He's talking about actions. He's even talking about these wicked people in the last verse. And more in regards to people, it says Psalms 5.5, 5, it says the arrogant. What does arrogant mean? People who basically pr very prideful, lifting themselves up, exaggerating their importance. It says right here, they cannot stand in the presence of God. The people who are high and lifted up, they cannot stand in the presence of God. And very next sentence, it says, you hate all who do wrong. Now, these are very strong statements that God is saying here. And then the next point before I get into haughty eyes is, so it's pretty clear in Scripture that the Lord hates. And then the next point is we all know that God is love. Right? It says in John, God is love. He doesn't just have love to give out. He literally, he literally is love. Like he can't separate himself from it. He doesn't have less or more of it. He is it. And how can God be love and also hate these things? Because the Bible never says that God is hate. God's love, it's pure, it's holy, it's righteous, it's perfect. It has no flaws. So how can God hate if God is love? And here's the point I want to make. Our, his response, or our response to this question is, how can he not? Like, if God is love, if he truly loves, how can he not hate sin and wickedness? How can he not? Or better put, how can God not react to the things that will and is out to destroy the very people and creation that he's put in place? If he's created you and me, if he's created creation and there's something that wants to come in and kill and destroy and separate, how can God not hate that thing? How can God not hate the things that hurt us? If God is truly love, if he has this intense and immeasurable and this crazy love for us, how can he not respond in that way? And one of the main points I have as well is that it is his love for us that drives his hate that the scriptures talk about. It's driven completely by his pure, righteous, and holy love. You know, if you love someone or if you love something and something is getting in the way or wants to hurt and wants to destroy, what is your reaction? Do you love the thing that's coming in to destroy and separate? You're probably going to respond in hate. If something wants to damage it, break it, you know, we usually don't respond in that way. There's a few things Billy Graham says. 
in, in accordance to God hating sin. God hates sin, this is what Billy Graham says, as a father hates a snake that threatens the life of his child. He hates evil and the forces that would pull people into godless eternity. He hates the things that are going to... He has created this perfect relationship, God and man. And sin came into the world and the devil is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And they're trying to pull people into an eternal life that is away from the presence of God. How can God not hate that? It's just God's heart, revealing God's heart in this and his hate towards sin. And these are very strong words. And he also says, Billy Graham, he says, We the church have failed to remind this generation that while God is love, he also has the capacity to hate. And he hates sin. And another thing he says is this generation, the generation we live in, has a difficult time to believe that God hates sin. Because as we live in this time and this culture, and we kind of get really comfortable with the sin around us, and we kind of get very lenient, but God has a standard. And it's not that it's bad for us. It's completely good. It's perfect. It's righteous. It's holy. It's a perfect standard why? Because he doesn't want us to get hurt. He doesn't want destruction to fall upon our lives. In John, if you read through John, it says he put his, his love was on display. How? In the fact that he went to the cross, that he laid down his life before we did anything. Igor actually mentioned that verse yesterday, while we were, or last week. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before you even responded to God, while you're still living in darkness, while you're still living in your sin and shame, before you even thought about it, before you even heard it, Christ saw you and he went to the cross. You know, before you even made a decision. These passages, they're some, sometimes they're hard to take in. You know, but they also make you realize like, how strong his love is is for us and how much we personally each and every one of us we matter to God that we're valuable that he would lay down his life in such a way and he put it on display for all to see but God in and of himself he's pure he is truth and the next point I want to make before we get into kind of the main topic as well kind of what we've already been talking about, is understanding the awfulness of sin. Understanding the, you know, maybe this is not what you want to hear in church, but it's the truth. You know, but sin is very destructive. And if we would see it rightly, if we would see it the way that God sees it, if we would see it rightly, if we would react rightly to it, maybe we'll be able to understand God's heart a little bit more. Because it's the, the Bible says that sin leads to death. One example is if every time you guys drove past the cemetery and you saw, see all the bodies and all the gravestones that are laying there and that you would realize in your mind that it is ultimately because of sin. You know, because God created this perfect relationship, you know, that we're supposed to live and walk with him. And, you know, because sin came, you know, we experienced this earthly death, you know. And all the pain and the hurt and the suffering that came into the world, ultimately why? Because sin came into the world. And if we would see it in that way, if we would see that it's sin that opens the doors to these evil things and these evil spirits that come and for some people take control of their mind and they're struggling to get free from something and it's all because of sin. Breaking families apart. You know, it doesn't lead to anything good and God cannot help but hate sin because it violates every part of who he is. Because why is it out? It's to kill, steal, and destroy. 
And we see the brokenness in the world, the brokenness in families and marriages and all, and all the children being raised up and working with the teens and working with the youths and seeing siblings and cousins and seeing just this generation that's growing up with all these issues. With all these mental games, you know, they're struggling to live free, to walk in freedom, to have a clear conscience, to not have anxiety. You know, it's all because of sin, ultimately. And we need to respond with the truth. And one thing I want to make clear is there's, there's God's hate and then there's, there's kind of our hate too. You know, our hate, when we, you need to differentiate the two because they're, they're not the same. Because I believe God's hate, when he hates sin, it's pure, it's holy, it's righteous, it's rooted. That's what it's rooted in. When we hate, it's because we got personally hurt, offended, anger, bad motives. That's just not the way that God hates. And God's hate does not make his love ineffective. The Bible said that God is love, but he also does hate sin and wickedness. You know, when when you're apart from Christ, he does it at the same time. Because in Colossians, it says, before you put your faith in him, it says you're an enemy of God. You're living apart from him. But at, at the same time, in Romans, it says, while we are still sinners, he died for you. Maybe it's something we can't fully understand. But when we practice those things, it, I believe it hurts his heart and it, he hates it. Because it violates who he, who he is. God's hate is pure, it's clean, it's wonderful, and it's beautiful. And when we see, I hope, I hope it, you guys really begin to see God's heart in this. That it's his love that truly drives his hatred towards the sin and the things in this world. Is it making sense a little bit? And what are we called to do? I think we're called to love, right? Love God, love your neighbors. I think we should also hate, begin to hate sin. So another thing, as we go through all these things every single week, it's a different topic. We need to learn to hate the things that God hates as well. You know, and we'll be able to love the things that God loves better. And why would he go through these things? Why would he go through all these things? I don't know the answer, honestly, but I'm just asking. But it could be a whole bunch of other stuff. To realize that maybe it will help us love better. Maybe it will help us live in freedom. If we start to take care of these things, maybe we're struggling with these things. And they need to be dealt with in our own hearts, in our own minds to walk in freedom. Or maybe we have a problem with these things. Lying and gossiping. And being prideful and looking down on others. Maybe we just love doing these things. Maybe we love doing these things. Maybe people do it all the time and don't even notice. And then we need to come to the realization that God God really doesn't approve of these things. Because his standard is so much higher. God's standard of living. You know, I see so many Christians and believers... They're living this life, and they're, they're kind of just doing whatever they want and disregarding the standard of God. You know, it's not that he doesn't want you to do anything. It's, it's a pure and righteous and a holy thing, that his standard. It's so that you don't get hurt. It's so that destruction doesn't come upon you and that we don't hurt ourselves. You know, many times in the scriptures, even in Matthew 5, it says, I mean, this is pretty crazy statement to be perfect for I am perfect but we do have this sanctification process I personally don't know how I'm supposed to be perfect (laughs) but we we strive for that 
right? That's, our standard is not other Christians or your friend who is a believer. Your standard is God, right? You look to God as your standard. You don't look to your community or even the church you're in. Oh, everyone's doing that. I guess it's okay now for me to do it. No, your standard is always Christ. Your standard is always God. God says in 1 Peter, be holy for I am holy. And his standard is good for us. You know, maybe we'd have a lot less issues in our life if we would uphold to that standard that he set for us. So now I want to get into the haughty eyes. When is the last time you heard anyone say that word? Has anyone even ever said that word? No? Literally no one in here has said that word. And that's the topic I have for today. <laughs> but it's actually, when we read, when we read modern, modern translations, even NIV, it says it so many times in scriptures, the word haughty. And I'm going to point out a few passages where else it's fine. In Psalms 18.27... It says, you save the humble, but you bring low those whose eyes are haughty. So God saves the humble, but you bring low the haughty. So maybe there's a correlation here, or maybe it's the opposite of being humble. And other translations, instead of haughty eyes, it says humiliates the proud. It says bring down the arrogant Another passage, Psalms 101, verse 5, it says, Whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. But whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. So there's a connection between haughty eyes and a proud heart. And haughty eyes, if you really look into the history and the definition, it's, it means altitude. It means high eyes. Someone who's looking from above, and you're looking down. And when we look at pride, it's kind of the same thing. It's someone who has a high opinion of himself or one's own importance. So you're both at a, when you have haughty eyes, when you have a pride, you're, you're looking from a place from above and you're looking down. You're looking down on other people. And C.S. Lewis says this in one of his books. He says, make no mistake, pride is the greatest sin. And it is the devil's most effective and destructive tool. Pride leads to every other vice. So maybe that's why haughty eyes is first on the list. Because pride may lead to all the other things. And it's an anti-God state of mind. It is, the pr it is pride that has been the chief cause of misery in every nation. And every family since the world began. Because what is pride? It's all about me. It's all about me. It's like, what can I get? It's all, what do I want? How can I get it? What people can I use to get what I need in my life? You know, and you really don't see other people as valuable, as people who are I or surface level with you. But you are looking at others from above. And I think that's the opposite Haughty eyes and pride is the complete opposite of who God is. If we look at Jesus and what he says in Matthew chapter 11, it says, Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. He says this, I am gentle and I am humble in heart. Jesus said that he is humble. He brings himself low. He's not a person who is completely about himself. He was always looking at you and me individually, personally. Looking at us individually. You know, it says that for the joy set before him, he went to the cross. The joy that you could have life, that you could receive repentance, that you could have life and life in abundance. It was for that joy that was inside of him, seeing you, that he went to the cross. And yet he created literally everything. And he came down here 
to display humility in such a powerful way. You know, when you describe God or if someone asks to describe God, one of the things that no one ever says is God is humble. It's always God is good, God is gracious, omnipotent, omnipresence, all these other things, but it's never God is humble. And that's the opposite of pride. That's the opposite of haughty eyes. You know, pride leads us to engage in other sins. It's always about yourself. So haughty eyes has something to do with pride, if not everything to do with it. Because you're lifting yourself up. And what do you imagine? If you think about haughty eyes, what do you imagine? Who do you imagine? Do you think of someone in particular? <laughs> do you think of yourself? Do you think of the person maybe sitting next to you? <laughs> but it's, it's looking down on others. You don't, you don't look at people at eye level. It's a heart posture of, I'm better than you. I'm above you. I'm more wonderful than you. It's a posture of, look at me. Fix your eyes upon me. I'm in the spotlight. Look at what I have done. Look at what I have accomplished. Even insecurity is pride. The root of insecurity is pride because it's, you want to be noticed. It's all about you. It's all about how you're struggling and how you have to go through this. And my, like your life is hard. It's all these insecurities that we deal with. It's really, it's all pride. It's completely about you. We don't see other people as equals. We look down on them. You know, if you have haughty eyes, you focus on the differences and the weaknesses of others. You know, when you walk, when you go through your life every single day, you're just completely focused on what people's weaknesses are, what they're different at. You don't look at the good things that they have, the good characteristics that they have. You're looking from above. You're quick to cast judgment. Haughty eyes are shallow eyes. They're surface level eyes, judgmental eyes, critical eyes. And they're nothing like the eyes of Jesus. You know, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. People with haughty eyes, they look at the outward appearance, very judgmental. But the Lord looks at the condition of your heart. You know, all the topics we hear about on the news and stuff like segregation, racism, intolerance, prejustice, they all come from haughty eyes and pride because we are better. And we look down on others. We look at sexual abuse and pornography and people using other people. Why? To take care of themselves for their benefit, for their satisfaction, not seeing others as valuable, not seeing others as eye level. Question for each and every one of us today. When we see those people at the grocery store at the, on, the, on the airplanes, you know, people wearing turbans, people wearing of different cultures, what do we think? Do we have haughty eyes toward them? What about the people when you're getting off the exit and the people who are standing with the signs who are homeless, who say, I need money or I need food? What is your first reaction when you see those people? That you're just, you are just so much better than them. What about the people who don't live according to your morals? Or in their sexualized culture, people who identify as certain things, how do you look at them? Not that their things are correct. Because we should hate evil and wickedness, but we also need to remember where we came from individually in our own sin, in our own unrighteousness. 
You know, and it's haughty eyes is something no one else really needs to know about. You know, something, it happens in your mind, and you think about it, but you're not really telling everyone about it, you know? It's kind of, it can kind of just sit in your mind. So really no one else knows that you're doing it or you even have it. But it can be something that every time you're just looking at people who are different or not like you or have a different lifestyle, you, you're just looking from above. Do you have haughty eyes? Do you look from above? Do you disregard people who are different? Because those people, even if they're living in their wickedness and in their sin, obviously God hates that, but he also, he died for them as well. He died for every single person. And when we look at Jesus, we look at someone who created everything, who was seated on the throne of heaven, and yet showed the biggest display of humility and brought himself low. How does Jesus look at people? We look at Scripture. We see how the children who are looked down upon in Scripture. He got down on his knees. He talked to them. He blessed them. We look at the lepers who are outcasts. Outcasts of society completely. What does Jesus do? He comes to them. He touches them. Women in that culture pushed aside. Jesus comes to them. Tax collectors who were hated, outcasts of society, he asked them to join him and be a disciple. Jesus' eyes are different. And we're coming to a close, and I really, I really want God's, to reveal God's heart in this, to reveal his love for us, that that's, what, that's what's driving his hatred of sin, really. And also that his kindness, that he is just so loving and merciful and kind, and he provides a way for each and every one of us, that that, would, that, that that would be the thing that would lead us to repentance, you know. If we have haughty eyes in our own life, or if we start to realize that we do have it, you know, in the following days in our lives when we're going through this life, and we begin to realize it. You know, we need to esteem others as higher than ourselves, it says in Philippians. I'm going to read a passage from Philippians chapter 2, and then I'll close. It says in verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking at your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset that Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used as an advantage. Jesus didn't even use his his equality with God as an advantage. As something to brag about. Verse 7, he said, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, Jesus brought himself low and he was exalted. Now this doesn't the Bible say that, you know, when we... Humble ourselves, he will lift us up. And those who are walking this earth high and lifted up, they will be humbled. When Jesus looks at us and sees our haughty eyes, he sees the sins. He saw everything that we've ever done and our mindsets and the things that we do. And he, looking right at each and every one of us, he still, he still went to the cross.
As we close, I want us I want us all to stand. And I want us to pray. And if God hates haughty eyes, how much more does he love eyes of humility? Eyes that begin to see people, eyes that begin to see and lift each other's up higher than to esteem others higher. If we can all close our eyes and just give some, a few moments and some time for the Holy Spirit to begin to work. Just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? What is he showing you? What is he revealing to you in your life? You know, in the quietness and the stillness, it's not awkward if you're truly pressing in to the Lord and asking, God, what are you saying to me today? Just a few more moments and then I'll close this in prayer. Father, we just come before you today. God, I thank you for your love. As a church, let's just begin to pray and really seek the Lord in this. Father, we just come before you today, God. God, we ask you to stir our hearts, Lord, to speak to our minds and our hearts today. God, that you would reveal any pride or haughty eyes that we have in our own heart, God. That you would begin to reveal the sin, Lord, that we have in our hearts, Lord God. And that we would just come to you, God. That we would see your love, that we would see your grace, that we would see your truth. And that we would see your kindness, Lord God. That you are always there, that you are always ready to forgive. And that you draw near to those who draw near to you. God, I pray that you would draw near to us. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your kindness this morning, God. And we just pray that you would come and move in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Did did anyone get anything from this message? I hope so, because it was kind of quiet, so maybe the Lord was uh, stirring. But there is a challenge I want to leave you guys with. When you're walking on your day-by-day, when you're going through your life, and you begin to just realize, like practically realize how you're looking at people, if you begin to see someone as less than or below you, begin to just proclaim in your mind or in your heart that they, they are made in the image of God, that they're valuable that God has died for them, and they matter, and that they're valuable. I I just pray that that really stirs in your heart. Amen? Amen. Come on, church. (laughs) All right, let's, uh, Igor, do you have any?